All right, so we're finally done with this unit. Uh, we're getting really close to the end, huh? And this phenomenon of colors, of fireworks, is kind of coming full circle. So in this number 33, a science and engineering practice on constructing an explanation, it says to write the electron configuration for the element responsible for one color of fireworks. And at first you might be like, uh, I don't know. Well, what if I give you a couple hints? Uh, we looked at a lot of them in the lab. So, for example, copper compounds give kind of a bluish green color. So, anytime you see like a blue or a green flame, uh, or like it could be, um, oh, have you ever had these little packets of chemicals that you splatter in your bonfires or campfires and they color the flame? It's probably copper. It's probably like some copper compound or kind of copper shavings. Cool. Changes the color of the flame. Uh, strontium and lithium give really pretty red colors. Kind of red, it's like crimson colors. They're really cool. Those are some of my favorites. Uh, potassium. gives off a purple color, kind of a purple lavender. And obviously, I mean, chemists can mix these compounds together and create all kinds of crazy colors. Uh, we looked at the pickle. Sodium gives off an orange flame. Calcium is kind of yellow. And so on. But there's all kinds of different compounds then that create these colors, and it just depends on what type of metal compound they were using. No way. And so a couple things here. We want to write the configuration for the element responsible for one of the colors of fireworks, and we could do any of these. I'm kind of feeling like, I'm kind of feeling like some strontium today. Strontium really is one of my favorites. It's like a really pretty deep red. It's unbelievable. Let's do the configuration of strontium. You are the winner today. So the electron configuration of strontium. I have to look it up on the periodic table. It's element number 38. So you have a couple options. You could do the long way, where I just start at the beginning. And I would say 1s2. And that's it for the first energy level. And then I start in the second energy level. 2s2. I hop across to boron. 2p6. That's it for the third level. Then, I'm in the second level. Hello. Now I go to the third level. I'm at sodium. 3s2 for sodium and magnesium. Then 3P6 gets me from aluminum to argon. Oh my gosh, strontium, we've got a ways to go. Uh, 4S2, then I'm at the 3D for 10. That gets me across to zinc, element number 30. And I have it marked in on my periodic table so I don't forget. That then when I get to 31 gallium, I'm back to the 4P for 6. That gets me a krypton. Oh, okay, we're kind of done. Uh, I just need the 5S for 2. There's all the electrons. That's a lot of electrons, huh? Craziness. Now you can also do the shortcut. I am always fine with the shortcut. The shortcut would mean that I get to save myself a lot of electrons. All of these guys are the core electrons. And it's just my outermost electrons that are valence. The highest energy level occupied by electrons in strontium would be the fifth. So I can shorten up all these core electrons. Whoopsies, core. I should have written a core electron. We'll put like a little E in there. And I could go to the previous noble gas, 
which would be krypton. I can put krypton in brackets. And then all I have to write is what comes after. 5s2. I'm digging that, right? Totally acceptable. It saves you 36 electrons. Krypton is 36 electrons. Awesome. So we've got the ground state configuration. Ground state just meaning where all the electrons are in their lowest energy level. When a valence electron is excited, this configuration changes. Use this information to explain how the valence electrons are involved in emitting this color of light. Okay, so I'm going to take a pause from the electron configuration, which I love, but I'm instead going to hop to the orbital diagram. Okay, so let's do some orbitals. Uh, this would be like the, I'm going to call this the 5s. And if I'm looking like beyond strontium, the next orbitals to fill would be the 4D. So I would have five of them, three, four, five. All these guys would come next. They'd actually be the 4D. And then if I kept going, if I went past the 4D, I'd be at cadmium, and then number 49, indium, would put me at the 5p. So this would be like the 5p. Okay, so here's the uh, kind of the um, outer-ish shell, I guess, of strontium. I put this as the row of the periodic table where you'd find strontium. Now, typically, strontium would just have the 5s2 fill. There is strontium in its ground state, its valence outermost electrons in the ground state. Okay, well, ground state would be like normal, low energy, but we know that if there is an outside source of energy, like heat or electricity, a spark, and think about if you ignite a sparkler, you're adding energy well, we know that when you add energy, those electrons can jump up to higher energy levels. And so here might happen if we excite the electrons. There was that rule about filling the orbitals low energy to high energy. Well, yeah, that's in the ground state. But what if I had something like this? And you look at that configuration and you say, <gasps> That could not possibly be okay, right? You can't put an electron in the 4D before you completely fill the 5S. And this is kind of where, remember that the 5D orbitals have more total energy than the 1S orbital. And I get that they're only in the fourth energy level, so they're a little bit smaller, but there are five of them and D orbitals are higher energy orbitals. So even though the s orbital might be a little bigger, there's only one, and an s, or an s orbital is just a lower energy orbital. So if I have electrons that are in higher energy orbitals than what I would expect, it just means that they're excited. This is excited. And it's okay. It just means that there would have been another energy source that caused the electron to jump up to a higher energy orbital. Oh, this would be the excited state. And so let's say I'm looking at red light. Strontium gives off kind of a red light. And if I think about the rainbow and the visible light spectrum, red light is a lower energy color. So I could assume that maybe this valence electron is making a lower energy jump. Maybe it jumped up just to like a little bit higher energy orbital, or maybe it went from like the, I don't know, the 5s to the 6s and then fell back down. And depending on exactly how much energy we absorbed, that would determine how much the electron can jump. Oh. And so it's these valence electrons on the outside of the atom that are absorbing the energy. They're jumping up to higher energy orbitals, maybe even higher energy levels. Like if I went from the 
5s to the 6s just depends on how much energy I'm absorbing. Now the excited state is never stable, so when the electron wants to go back down to its ground state, it's got to release that energy in the form of light. So if I see a lower energy color, I can assume that the electron is making a low energy transition. Maybe it's only going up like one set of orbitals, maybe it's just going to the 4d, or maybe it's going to the 5p, maybe the 6s, but it's for sure not going up to like the seventh energy level or, or beyond that. This is making a pretty low energy transition because I'm seeing a low energy color of light emitted. But when I see like a higher energy color like the blues or the purples of copper and potassium, then those valence electrons are making the larger energy transitions. So the valence electrons in the outside of the atom are jumping way up to higher energy levels and higher energy orbitals. Obviously not stable. So they're falling back down to the ground state, releasing higher amounts of energy. And we see that then as the higher energy colors. 